In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, in previous years, dear faithful, you can listen to all these online, sspx.uk, under media. So if you want to find out what the spiritual significance of uh, today's gospel particularly is, then you can uh, look at the, or listen to the sermons from the past few years. But I have been eager to use the example given in today's gospel to emphasize that people aren't what they wear. So the habit doesn't make the monk, or we shouldn't judge a book by its cover. But it's true that today's epistle and gospel confront us with the example of a man's interior disposition being shown by his external behavior, or indeed in the gospel, what he wears exteriorly. The epistle compares our living of a Christian life to putting on a garment, says St. Paul. And indeed, uh, our old way of life, our life of sin, is like a dirty overall which we have to take off and put on Christ instead, which is a renewal of our internal and indeed uh, external life. So we put away vices, shun all lies, anger, uh, injustice and so on, and adorn our soul with virtues, zealously seeking after Christian justice and perfection. In fact, I think it's a bit later in this letter to the Ephesians where St. Paul talks about acquiring virtue and comparing it to putting on the armor of God so that we can fight effectively against temptation. And as I said in the uh, gospel, the garment is the significant object which decides whether the man may stay at the wedding feast or not, i.e., um, if they've filled this banquet, which is an image of the church, as I've said in previous years, they've filled this banquet with good and bad, then um, it's an image, therefore, of the ones who are saved, the ones who are not saved, who haven't got on the wedding garment, they're chucked out into the exterior darkness um, where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. So um, I, I've talked about the sp spiritual significance of that in previous years. So I thought this year, instead, what I'll do is I'll take this example in the Gospel to talk about something which uh, is, I think, relatively interesting anyway, but it's particularly interesting at the present time because we've got so many new people come in the uh, universities opened up again and so people wonder in um, new people or perhaps um, they've come from another church and uh, decided to give this lot of a go and see how that uh, carries on uh, or of course people watching online uh, it's got an application for, for many people so I thought I would talk today about the Catholic practice of women covering their heads in church. Now, I didn't want to look at this in a purely historical way, because if you look at it in an historical way, <laughs> it, is, it is going to be very monochrome, because this started in the Christian church, at least it was legislated about, uh, under St. Linus. We celebrated his feast a few weeks ago, didn't we? 23rd of September. Uh, it um, is the second pope, so the successor, the first successor of St. Peter. And it didn't change any time after that. So that's 2,000 years of unbroken Christian history. It's been in local legislations and documents. We've got, and when all that was all codified by St. Pius X and published in 1917, there it was. So... Um, that would be the end of the sermon. So I thought, no, I won't do that. What I will do 
is look at sacred scripture because this is mentioned in sacred scripture in I think it's the 11th chapter of St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Now this is the bits that are normally quoted. <laughs> you can imagine in the 21st century will make people roll their eyes and uh, mumble about uh, the obsolete view of uh, patriarch patriarchal view of humanity or emphasizing the inferiority of women. And indeed, I mean, the texts say things like the man indeed ought not to cover his head. So if you have wandered in with a baseball cap, whip it off. Um, the man indeed ought not to cover his head because he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. For the man was not created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Oh, but then you get the next verse. And this is really interesting because it puts all of that in context. So you know exactly what St. Paul is getting at. And there are two things in it. Yeah, there are two things. I'll explain both of them just now. Um, which bring that context to it. And the verse is, Therefore ought the woman to have a veil on her head because of the angels. Now I say there's two things, and you can only see one reason given there. But it's interesting, because she ought to have a veil on her head is a modern translation. This is what it says in the modern Bibles. Um... Whereas in the Dewey, which is the Catholic Bible that you probably all read, it doesn't say that. Neither does it say it in the Vulgate, which is the official Bible of the Catholic Church, in Latin. And neither does it say it in the Greek original. It doesn't say that. The word that's used in the Greek is exousia. And in the Latin, it's potestatem. So it means authority. She should have an author a sign of her authority on her head. Much like the priest wears a beretta when he's preaching as a sign of his authority as a, a, a member of uh, uh, the clergy to preach to you. Or a bishop will wear a mitre as a sign of his authority. So all this anxious clucking and sucking of teeth about the veil being a sign of a woman's submission is... So much 21st century nonsense makes no sense at all in the context that St. Paul talks of. Um, it's actually the, the, the veil being a sign of a woman's authority is very interesting. And even more interesting is the reason why this is so. Because, says St. Paul, of the angels. Why on earth would it matter to the angels what a woman puts on her head? Are they here? Are they watching us here at Mass? Yes, yes, dear faithful, they actually are. I mean, you've probably noticed, I mean, there's various ways of expressing it in the different prefaces that we use. But before I start the angelic hymn, I prefix it with the words, therefore, with angels who are here with us, with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominations, with all the heavenly host, we sing the hymn of thy glory, endlessly saying, Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. St. John Chrysostom says, the angels are present here. Open the eyes of faith, and look upon this sight. For if the air is filled with angels, how much more so the church? And then he goes on. Hear the apostle teaching this when he bids the women to cover their heads with a veil because of the presence of the angels. And St. Cyril of Alexandria goes even further, saying, The angels find it extremely hard to bear if this law i.e. women covering their heads, is disregarded. So why does it bother the angels so much if women don't cover their heads? Well, I think the answer lies in the very nature of angels. 
The celestial hierarchies are the spiritual reality of ordered creation. The stable patterns in which disruption is unknown. Obedience is the characteristic of the angelic realm. Without obedience, there is chaos and disorder. St. John Chrysostom goes on to say that the veiling of women ministers effectively to good order among mankind. And taking off the veil, he says, is no small error. It is disobedience. It disturbs all things and betrays the gifts of God and casts to the ground the honour bestowed. For to the woman it is the greatest of honour to preserve her own rank. To some who argue that a woman, a woman by taking off her covering mounts up rather to the glory of man. Chrysostom answers, she doth not mount up but rather falls from her own proper honour, since not to abide within our own limits and the laws of God, but to go beyond, is an addition, is not an addition, but a diminution. And there's another point, St. John Chrysostom this time. He's talking about the dignity and honour of women. It's not to do them down and cover them up like the Muslims or something. This is a sign of their dignity and honour that they reign with their husbands. Or if they're very young and aren't married yet, then they reign with their fathers in, as part of the Christian family. But it is a dignity and an honour for them to do that. That's why St. Paul mentions it. In fact, curiously, he says in the letter to the Galatians, for though there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So, there is an equality in salvation. But that does not mean that men and women are the same. The issue here is order, not superiority or inferiority. It is putting things in their proper order. At the beginning of this 11th chapter, St. Paul compares men and women to God the Father, men, and God the Son, women. God the Son is not inferior to God the Father. He is not. That would be a heresy. They are consubstantial. They have the same nature. But they are not the same person. So though equal in nature, men are not women, and women are not men. They are not interchangeable. This is a real thing that started off in the 60s, isn't it, really? When it sort of became a fashion for women to cut their hair like men or to wear men's clothes, trousers, jeans. It's the universal form nowadays to wear jeans and trousers like, women, like men. And they'd wear men's shirts or something. It, would, it became a little bit of a fashion. And that's why I suppose this teaching... <laughs> This millennial teaching of the church is not very popular nowadays. You're not going to get this in your Novas Ordo masses, priests standing up here and saying, hey, cover your heads, women, because they're all, oh, oh, it doesn't sound very modern. <laughs> well, you know, those sort of things back in the 60s, we can call it a silly fad, if you like, really, feminism or something, but it's now progressed, of course, because these things do. If you don't stop an error when it's in the bud, it will blossom and grow. So now, <laughs> we're not even allowed to talk about sex on a passport uh, application or a driving license or an enrolment in a school. That's all gone now, the biological reality of what sex is, and it's been replaced by gender which is grammatical. That's a grammatical term. It's nothing to do with men and women. It's absolute nonsense. And the king parades around, uh, porkin as we say in Welsh, with no clothes on, 
And everyone says, oh, isn't this marvellous and enlightened? But it's going to go further. We can already see it. Uh, it goes beyond the acceptance of butch women or effeminate men and now advocates physical mutilation of their bodies. The physical mutilation of their bodies. And, and that for prepubescent children. <laughs> People used to talk about getting in touch with your feminine side, that we've all got inside us a masculine side. Everyone's got a masculine side and a feminine side. So where's that gone? <laughs> well, it's been exaggerated to such an extent that there's chaos in modern society, not least among adolescent boys and girls. This is the rejection of God's law. Indeed, <laughs> even physical human nature. Now, St. Paul takes that as going without saying, but he adds to it the dimension that as Christians, we both have exousia, authority, or power as children of God. But a woman's authority is distinctly feminine, as a man's is distinctly masculine. Hers does not contradict or usurp his, but complements it. And as the Trinity would not be complete with one of the three missing, so man and woman are both essential to each other and to the whole. And the angels watch what we do, and they rejoice when we obey. We've just had the feast over St. Michael the Archangel last Wednesday, I think it was. <laughs> the angel who guides people to their judgment. The one who's often pictured with a set of scales in his hand, and a sword, but a set of scales, because he's the angel of the judgment. And then yesterday, of course, we had the guardian angels, and the gospel for both those masses was the same. It was the same gospel that talks about this presence of the angels, and in particularly in the case of children, watching over them, <coughs> watching over them, protecting them from danger, but also recording that danger. They are always seeing the face of God, it says in the Gospel. They always see the, the, the face of God. Now look, God is omniscient. He doesn't need the angel's tail-bearing to tell him what's going on, but he has disposed that that is exactly what they will do. They will record these things. They will record virtues, they will record sins. They will record everything. They will record wrongs done. And in this particular case that our Lord quotes, uh, against children. Better that there is a millstone put around his neck and he's chucked into the sea. If he does that, scandalizing one of these little ones. And it will be recorded by the angels of God. So I don't know if that's an extra motivation for you to know that you're being watched. You're being watched at all times and particularly, obviously, at the worship of God in the church. Can't imagine the angels saying, oh, no, I've got so many other things to do, I won't bother going to church today. When you've all come, they want to be here. So they are here. The two realms, worshipping God, humans and angels together, worshipping God each in their own way. So a veil might be a small matter, um, but obedience often hinges on small things, small choices. When men see a veil on a woman, it signifies obedience to God, a way of living her womanhood. It is her feminine I am, reflected outwardly. In putting on her head covering, she says to God, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. Thy will be done, not mine. Both men and women need to think about what they wear when they come to God's house, particularly on a Sunday, 
God's day. We are not our clothes, but at the same time, our clothes are an expression of our interior life. Since we can think about what we wear, and then we use our will to decide what we'll wear. Those are both interior actions of the soul. It's not just a pure external thing, completely accidental. No, this is an expression of interior acts, the intellect and the will. Perhaps up to now we haven't thought about it or haven't thought about it in that way, but now is the time to put on Christ, to clothe ourselves in his virtue, and prepare ourselves for the heavenly banquet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs>